Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that you've given us and bless this word uh, as it ministers into the hearts of your children, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're going to go back. Yes, guys, we're going to go back to our theme. We're still discussing this area of subject of we are prepared for kingdom. Uh, and Ephesians chapter 4 uh, verses 11 through 16. We've been working through these verses or working through the principles of these verses. We have not necessarily been working through the verses chronologically as if we're trying to uh, textually analyze every verse. Uh, we've tried to hopefully giving you the different topics that are are uh, connected to this verse to help us to understand the proper application of this verse in our lives as children of God. I hope and pray that that's what uh, you all have been able to glean from it. So we've done three sessions. We're going to do at least this one. Fourth will be four. Uh, and so let's get ready. Ephesians chapter four. Let's turn to it. And so we can read it together. And he gave some, verse 11, just so you're all in the same spot I'm in. Uh, and he gave some apostles, some evan prophets, some ev evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, uh, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and the, of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of, a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they uh, lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, who is with me, where we would say that, of all, the head, even Christ, uh, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which joint, that supply, that joint supplieth, that every joint supplieth, I apologize, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That's a whole mouthful as we get to the last verse there. Uh, we may be able to wrap it up today. I'm going to give it a try. But the first thing we want to do is make sure we got, we've got we kind of uh, worked our way through the first section. So what we've been doing, as I said before, we've been kind of looking at this from perspective uh, of what the uh, of what the conversation is really about. And so different topics and subject matters that, that connect to it have been our focus. Today, we're going to kind of zero in right here on this text, kind of be, get a little exegetical today uh, and try to uh, just kind of clarify what's happening here. And then we'll we'll use what we have to use to help connect to it. Because, of course, every word is established in Scripture, the, the Word of God. Truth is established by the, uh, by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So we, we always want other witnesses in the Scripture, different texts that will kind of support and or validate uh, the text we're reading. So uh, as we look at that, this is an area of focus in which we want to really zero in on the function of preparation. We're, we're really looking to hear at the function of preparation, okay? Uh, and this idea of preparation gives us a couple of things to work with. For instance, not one part of this is to be supplied and equipped. So to understand being supplied and equipped, we run with the concept uh, that we have what we need, or uh, we might want to say that we have um, the tools on our tool belt that are necessary. We have all the necessary tools on our tool belt and that we have been trained to use them. This is important because equipped is not just external equipment or apparatus that might be used, but equip also is concerned with internals, not just, ex not just externals or externalities, but it's things that are internal that are a part of you. That, is in that includes things like knowledge and wisdom, 
to successfully carry out the calling and the missions that are given to our lives. All right, uh, that's that's how we that's how we deal with this. Okay, so let's look at a little bit more exegetical today. Looking at this text, meaning we're gonna kind of dig uh, into this text itself. Uh, yeah, uh, we're going to excavate, as it were. We're going to dig in here. All right. So one of the parts we've already discussed is that this is a ministry. It's a service. And that God has given us special training or given us, as I said last week, special forces, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to help us with this area and develop us. As the, as, as the book of Jeremiah it remarks, I will give you pastors according to my heart. Right. Uh, that in chapter three. So it's important that we're starting with the premise that, okay, this that was it's an equipping process. God is dealing with an equipping and not just, like I said, externals. The externals will be there as needed, but the internals are very, very important here. All right. So let's go a little further within this text of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Till we all come to come into the unity of faith. So we call, all come into the unity of faith. So. This equipping and this building up, this edifying, right, this this perfecting, this maturing of the saints, is going to go on, right? This 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 maturing is going to go on till till what? Till meaning not just until, which is the general idea that we will get from this word, but also this word in the Greek says uh, suggests to us that to get to the degree, to the degree. There's a, to a degree that we're a tr- we are, it's necessary for us to achieve. You've got to get this, uh, not actually a paper degree, but a level of understanding and comprehension, a measure of uh, mastery that is necessary to in order to complete the callings and the ministry that we are called to. We should never presume, as many do in the, in the general and generalize in our culture, particularly about. Uh, things that are what they call soft sciences and ideas that are, uh, I guess we want to call them uh, humanities, ideas that, such as uh, art, ideas such as um, uh, philosophies, viewpoints, uh, and of course religion. People believe these are areas where they can all make up their own particular mind and have the right answer, my belief, my faith, and my thought. I'm going to have to say I reject that, and the Bible agrees with me. The Lord has made it very clear that he alone is God, and there is there is one name under heaven whereby men must be saved. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every knee will bow, must bow, and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's a key element that we've got to accept that <clears throat> there is a true answer, not just the answers that we might come up with. There is a true answer. That's an important element that we've got to uh, adapt and kind of separate and divorce ourselves from the cultural uh, uh, panoply of uh, answers that, that tend to be out there for things like this, okay? Uh, <clears throat> till we all come to, uh, that is to say, we get to the degree of mastery, right? of unity, in the unity of faith, being unified or having oneness in our faith, right? Oneness in our faith and in the knowledge and our acknowledgement, our acknowledgement and our understanding of the Son of God. All right. So it's important in this, from this perspective, we got to know that this is about knowing the Son of God. We cannot have different views about the Son of God. One of the cultural views uh, that is current and popular is this idea of Jesus as just one of the good religious leaders who said good things or was a, in the Islam, he is a great prophet. Uh, but the, th- the thing that distinguishes us in Christianity is a clarification that Jesus is Lord. He's not just one of the great speakers or great talkers who gives nice philosophy and he has nice things to say or wisdom for people to take in as if he's one of the sages or the shaman of his day. Oh no, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God incarnate, Yahweh, giving himself into our flesh and giving himself up on the cross, dying, making himself of no reputation as a Philippians 2 gives us a good example of making himself a, uh, available 
in this uh, way that they say, the Greek term of kenosis or kenosis uh, in, interprets that he empties or pours out like a glass, emptying out the wine of it, that he, he pours it out himself of his, empties himself of his of his uh, splendor and his divinity and his things that he's so great in order to separate, separate from that in a temporary mode to pull on human flesh. Not that those things weren't right there, but he just, he chose to separate himself from it in the presence of mankind, in the, in the personhood that is of Jesus Christ. So this has to be understood. The, one of the early uh, ideas that, that, that those, those, so, what do you call it, subordinated Jesus theologies come from, is from a man named Arius, who was a musician uh, as part of the early church uh, uh, under the Bishop of Alexander, Alexandria, if I remember correctly, and uh, that he thought to himself that if Jesus said, I don't know, I, I, that the, I don't the end my father has, uh, and that the father doeth the works, that he was in a, in a, in, a, in effect he was diminishing his authority, that he was not uh, God, but in reality he was operating subordinate, intentional. All right. This and uh, this is a concept I remember Dr. Ober and I are teaching one of my great professors uh, teaching that that uh, this subordinated, this temporal subordinate subordination, this temporary subordination of himself was for purpose because a price had to be paid on the cross at Calvary. And it was this Jesus Christ who did pay that price at the cross of Calvary for all man's sin, not to the Jews only, but to the the whole world, hallelujah. So this was a key element then that we have to understand so we know truth. So th then I'm kind of getting to the point that when I did with t this until word and this idea of coming to the knowledge of the Son of God unto a per perfect man, meaning a mature and unto the metron or the measure of the stature, that is the fullness, the, the full uh, maturity of the fullness of Christ, full maturity in knowing what is the real full picture of who Jesus Christ is. A lot of times that's not clear when you just read the story of Away in a Manger, you know, and um, how the three, how the, not just three, but the, the Magi or the wise men came from the East. You don't get the full picture of Jesus and he heals, uh, when he heals um uh, the, well, let's not deal with the healing, just early days when he turns the water into wine at the wedding in, in John. These things are important elements of him, but they're not the full, they're not the full picture of who Jesus is. It is really important to know that Jesus is God. He's not some other. He's not a part. He is God. He simply chooses to represent himself in flesh and chose to come through a woman by his own spirit, meaning Holy Spirit, having endowed and uh, come upon her, talking about Mary, and um, being born in flesh for the sake of a legitimate legal human being paying the price for a human being that is Adam and Eve's sin. Okay, that's very important foundational principles. We are Christians because we believe that Christ is God and that he died on the cross and that he rose again for our sins and, 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 and with, with salvation all in his hands for everyone that believeth on him. That's key. So that's why I want to break this little exegetical on verse 13 and then verse 14, that we henceforth uh, no more be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So verse 14. So let's break that down a little bit because this is important as well. All right. So that we will stop acting like and behaving like and being limited to the, the level of children within our, that is, that is in the knowledge of our faith, in our ability to explain, break down, walk by, uh, pray through, understand our faith, which is in Jesus Christ. We need to no longer be, well, I kind of know this, I, I heard this, I think this is what God said. 
we need to know what the Lord says. And therefore, when we are in our prayer life, when we are in our just thought life, in our mind, what we think about when we go through the day, we need to have the truth of God operating alongside our human consciousness and our thoughts and our, our plans and our track for the day. And we should be, we should be considering the Lord during the day. We should be considering his word and his words and his plan and his uh providential uh, uh, expressed providence throughout history as we go through the day. That's what will help us uh, actually be mature. That's how we make mature decisions, spiritually mature decisions. Keep that in mind. Okay. All right. So no more tossed to and fro by whoever pops up with a new church, new name, this, this, that, and the other. And they want to teach you a new doctrine. There is no new doctrine. You know, there is no, well, I believe this, believe, I believe this, none of that. What it, what is true is what God said is true. And it doesn't vary on individuals. Different individuals don't get to make up their own belief in truth. Matter of fact, just really quickly, and then we'll move on. Uh, turn over to, if you would, Second uh, Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. This really isn't in the lesson, but just call. I want to share you on share with this with you because I want to put it out there and, and put it in your thought pattern. Okay. So Second Peter chapter one. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse one, verse 20. Uh, oh, no, verse 19 and 20. Just follow me to verse 19 and verse 20. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. You will do well if you take heed to this, right? As unto light that shineth in dark in a dark place. Unto dawn, day and dawn, day dawn, and the day star arising or rise in your heart. So this is telling you what he's saying is if you want to know the have the light, you want to have the truth, take hold of this that I'm saying to you. Knowing this first, number one, first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So that means people don't get to have their own truth when it comes to God. God is the truth. People don't get to have their own opinion even about God. God is the truth. So our job then, when we talk about different doctrines and even different denominations, has to deal with the fact that we have to work and wrestle. And what the scripture says, study to show ourselves approved uh, unto God, um, uh, rightly dividing the word, right? Rightly dividing the word of truth. So our job is to study so as to prove unto God, work with the need to not to be ashamed, rightly focusing so we can properly separate. Dividing means to create categories or understand this structure, this system, or this idea separated from that idea of that idea. Okay? That's really important for us. So we have that. All right. So God has the answer, and His word is the answer. We don't privately get to make up our own interpretations and answers. We seek what God says. Find out what he says. Look at that word. Study that word. Go get the original tongue. Go get the analysis of the tongue in colloquial terms and things and move from there. All right, back to our text here. All right, so Ephesians chapter 4. So we see maturity of knowledge, understanding of the knowledge of who Jesus is and God is, is central to this. We cannot have confusion on Jesus and then mature. We cannot work and come to a unity of faith if we got different viewpoints about who Jesus is, who God is. How can we be have a unity of faith? That's impossible. So to that end, let's look at this uh, area of uh, Hebrews chapter 6, all right? Because education of the saints is imperative. No no one can say to you or should ever tell you that you don't need to study God's word a lot. You need to study his word a lot. If anyone says that to you, look out, you're being hoodwinked. You're being hoodwinked. Somebody's up to trying to manipulate because they want to be the one to tell you all the answers. If I point people to the scripture because I believe that if you read the scripture, the scripture is the teacher. I'm just helping you. The scripture is going to teach you. If you study God's word, his Holy Spirit, you pray and along with that. His Holy Spirit will help you to understand. And I got a testimony, a witness to that in John chapter 14. So here we go. Chapter six of Hebrews. He says important word. Therefore, leaving 
verse 1, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. That is, we go that word perfection again, maturity. Let us go on to maturity. Let's stop being little kids. Let's stop being easily manipulated. The church should not be confused about righteousness. The church should not be believing everything that pops up. I, I have at times brought up little examples to kind of, you know, kind of jog your memory and cause you to think about it. Like the church taking on the idea of karma. So that's not, that's not a Christian word. That comes out of Indian paganism. We don't support that. We support what Jesus said, the golden rule, which is Jesus said, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Do ye unto others as you have them do unto you. Basically, you know, they, that's a couple of different phrases, phraseologies that paraphrases of that. But basically, do ye also unto men as you would have men unto do unto you. Is that's That's what you do. Do what you want to happen to you. That comes from Jesus, not karma. Not karma. We don't preach karma. Okay, so here's why we have to know these things. We have to be educated. All right. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, that is, the basics, let us go on to maturity, right, perfection, maturity, not again, not laying again the foundation of the repentance of, from dead works and of the faith toward God. Okay, so he's saying don't. We don't have to keep on going and telling, telling people, okay, you need to leave those sinful works alone. That's uh, that's a given. That's true. We agree. But is that what we're going to focus on Sunday after Sunday, Saturday after Saturday, Wednesday class after Wednesday class? No. Let's go on further from there of the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on hands. We're going to teach you about baptism again. We're going to teach you about laying on hands. How often are we going to need to do that? With the new saints or those who are uh, less experienced? Yeah. That class for the new saints will include that. But the whole church ought to be moving forward. And this is what the apostle is warning that that is how important that is. And the resurrection of the dead, that we know we're going to be raised. Jesus was rose and we're going to be raised as well. That's all over the scripture. We've been taught that for years. And the final judgment, the eternal judgment. Do I need to teach that again? I, sometimes I think so because we've had so many uh, um, frivolous uh, her her heretical doctrines out there about not, no hell and things like God is not going to punish wickedness. Well, if God is not going to punish wickedness, this God could not be a righteous God. You can't be a righteous uh, leader or righteous Lord or righteous government king and you let evil people overrun the land and never punish and stop and punish them. You know, a good king or good leader or certainly God must stop evil and therefore punishment must be uh, must be uh, employed. All right. Verse three. And this we do if God permit. So there's importance for us to mature, learning more about God, learning more about the purposes and the kingdom of heaven. This is why we have to study and move forward. Now here, and, and why? Because of the threat of apostasy. All right. Threat of apostasy. And I talked about this when I leave, used the case of Arian, uh, Arius, I'm sorry. And he, he created a religious sect a, a break off from the church, one of the early break offs. You know, we got all these denominational break offs now, but one of the earlier ones we're talking about in the first hundred years or so, uh, about, I think about a hundred and, uh, I can't remember the year exactly, so I do apologize. But in the early, like maybe 150 uh, AD after Christ, you know, the, the, these, these things were coming up. The church was developing and little sects were breaking up. One of the sects that broke off was Arianism. Well, Jesus is, Jesus is a lesser part of God. Yeah, he's the son of God, but so are we sons. See, we're sons of God. And he's, 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 he's great, yes, but he's not God. That he's a subordinate version of, of a lesser of God is, is incorrect and can't be accepted. But it, that's what happened in the early, one of the things that happened in the early church, along with a bunch of other stuff. But let's move forward. So apostasy. Last thing I want to hit on, and I think that's all we're going to be able to do, is this. Um, the apostasy element that comes as a risk is in chapter 5 of Hebrews. So you're in, you're in Hebrews chapter 6. This is go back a little bit with me, chapter 5, verse 11. So, of whom we have many things to say. Uh, we're talking about Melchizedek, Melchizedek and so forth and the, the great things of the Son of God, but let's go on. We have many things to say and hard to be uttered, um, 
seeing ye are dull of hearing. So here the apostle is basically indicting the church, the early church there. This is Apostle Paul. Uh, at least we believe it to be Apostle Paul because the, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews never self-identifies. So it, to some degree, it's a speculation. All right. Um, he says, you can't understand a lot of the things you need to understand because your ears are dull of hearing. Well, how do my ears get dull of hearing? How do our ears get dull of hearing? Hearing. Well, because we're not focused on important things. We're focused on things that don't matter. Like a lot of times we in the modern era, we got people that are so focused on screens, on social media, on games, on toys. I'm talking grown folks, not children. Children, I wouldn't say this to children, but I'm talking about grown folks. And they're, they are not focused on things that matter, things that pertain to life and eternal life. And so they are missing the purpose that God has for them. Very, very dangerous times. He says they're dull of hearing. They can't even, they can't take a 45-minute sermon. They're about to fall out in 45 minutes. But they'll watch t 10 shows, what they call it, a, a binge watch. 10 shows of the same thing on TV. But they can't take 45 minutes of the teaching of the gospel of the Lord. It's, a, it's quite an indictment that goes on in our churches these days. Um, for when, verse 12, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, uh, teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. So at the time you should be at the new level, you're at a point where you need to be taught the basics all over again. All right. And our such as become in need of milk and not strong meat for everyone that uses meat. I'm sorry, milk, I'm sorry, is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Verse 13, for he is a babe. Verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. And we would probably interpret and translate that word age, full maturity, full development, right? What we've been talking about from Ephesians. Even though, even those who by reason of use, because they've been using it, by reason of use, because they've been practicing it, because they've been studying it, because they've been meditating on it, because they've been praying over it. This is of use that have their senses exercised. They've been strengthened and they've built up themselves to discern both good and evil. So really what we want to do is make sure we are encouraging one another this very important thing. We have a task to come to a great place in God, to a place of leadership. We are to be the authority in the earth. We'll talk about that another time. But God has designed us for that. We are called to a great and a holy calling. And yet we have many times not us taking the time to be fully developed, even in what we have now, before we move to that next level. So let's just be faithful. Let's be diligent. Let's be dutiful and ready to receive what God has blessed us with, that we may have, with joy receive him and his word and promise with blessing and gladness. I pray this will bless you and keep you in Jesus' name. Amen.